a couple comedians and I give our reaction to Chris Rock's new Netflix special on this episode of Cultured. for another episode of Cultured. Um, if you haven't already, please hit that bell, uh, hit that like and subscribe and share button so that you can know when new videos come out. You know, this channel has actually been doing pretty good. I started doing this podcast maybe, I don't know, maybe like three or four months ago. I started out with 77 subscribers and guess how many I have now? 121. So... <laughs> <laughs> if, if I was putting up videos every day, I would have probably like a thousand by now, but I only have done 10 episodes in the course of like three or four months. So, I mean, that's kind of on me, but thank you so much for actually uh, following and listening to the podcast. I've actually gotten messages from a lot of people on Instagram who have actually watched the podcast. They've nice. actually, they've actually um, uh, said specific things that I've said. They said, oh, I didn't know this, or I learned this, or whatever. So I really appreciate people taking the time to uh, to listen and to share and to leave comments. Make sure you leave that comment below so we can engage in the conversation. Um, you know what to do. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Keenan Jerome, uh, Keenan J. Floyd, K-E-N-A-N-J-F-L-O-Y-D. Um, and also, you can join my mailing list for upcoming shows on my website, www.keenanjeromefloyd.com. Today, I am joined by two hilarious comedians um, who are in the Los Angeles area. Um, first, we have the amazing Sneak with Scarlet, and we Hello. have the amazing Melanie Mary. Both comedians here in Los Angeles. First, I would like to start with Sadiqwa, just real fast. Where are you from, Sadiqwa? What's, what do you want to tell the people? Yeah, yeah. Hey, hey everyone. Um, my name is Sadiqwa Scarlett, like he just said, and I am originally from Brooklyn, New York City. I've uh, been in Los Angeles for approaching three years now. I uh, came here to pursue my dreams and, of course, comedy, acting, writing, all that good stuff, modeling, because I'm cute, you know. Um, and, um, uh, just, you know, doing my thing, performing all over town. That's what's up. Um, Melanie, tell us, tell the people. Um, well, I'm originally from Chicago, Illinois, the South Side. Um, and before I moved to Los Angeles, I lived in Atlanta for five years. And I'm approaching my eighth year here in Los Angeles. So in addition to being a comedian, I'm also a licensed attorney. I'm licensed to practice in both Georgia and most recently California. I got licensed here in 2021. So that's what I did with my pandemic time. Um, but I've been doing stand up since 2018. And yeah, I'm out here. I'm out in these streets. I have a show. I'm hosting a show, which actually Keenan is going to be on at Underdogs in Glendale on Wednesday, March 15th. So get your pre St. Patrick's Day turn up on with us. I have another show at Tao or Dow Comedy Studio 130 Southwestern on Saturday, March 25th. So that's what I have going on at the moment. All right. So this here's my question. Do black people, do we um, do we celebrate St. Patrick's Day? 
Well, I'm from Chicago, so everyone celebrates St. Patrick's Day in Chicago. Everyone's Irish <laughs> on St. Yeah. Patrick's Day. <laughs> Well, I mean, I wonder how many- Just like we celebrate Cinco de Mayo. <laughs> I wonder how many black people are actually Irish because I got some Irish in my blood too. Like, like I, I got- um, Very little. <laughs> yes, like either Irish and black people must have been getting together because I'm- So my sister, she did the, the family tree a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And this kind of shows how, how much people care about certain parts of their uh, ancestry because we're Cherokee- we're uh irish and we're some sort of caribbean but, some sort <laughs> but, but we don't know but we don't know which caribbean it, it is and i literally mm -hmm. asked her i'm like yeah but where's the black from like she's like oh we're like we're cherokee and irish and i'm like sure but where's the black <laughs> i want to know like the black where's the black from and the yeah. reason is because i'm originally from mobile alabama right and if you know history about Mobile, is that it was the last, it was the port where the last slaves were brought to America. Mm, okay. The last slaves were brought to America during the Civil War. Wow. And the ship, and actually the Obamas actually just came out with a documentary about it. Um, I forget what it's called. Uh, maybe at the end we'll reveal... Uh, the name of the documentary that the Obamas <laughs> did about the slaves that came to America, the last slaves. They started their own town north of Mobile, maybe like 30 miles or so uh, from Mobile called, it was called Africa Town. But now it's called mm -hmm. Plateau, Alabama. Mm -hmm. So that was a settlement started by African slaves during the Civil War in the United States. Wow. And we had a... Uh, an uncle, a great uncle that lived in Plateau. And that's kind of what got me on the journey where I was like, okay, well, where, like, are we from? Are we, are we, like, are we from, like, a specific part of Africa or something? Because that history is very close. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, that's not a long, that's not that long ago that the last slaves came. You no. know what I mean? So you can, so in, like, two or three generations, you can trace back exactly, like, where we came mm -hmm. from. But I don't know yet, so... Or you can just do ancestry. They'll give you the breakdown. Like I'm 15% Nigerian. I'm like 25% Polish. So like they'll give you the breakdown. So altogether, I'm like 58% 50, European, 42% West African. So it told me like in the countries, like all the countries, but those are the ones that stuck out to me. Well, I am. Um, yeah. Yeah. I really want to know. I mean, I'm almost afraid that I might be Nigerian. Why you I mean, you definitely that? are. Either we I'm all not, are. You know, one of the Western uh, countries on the Western coast of Africa. Um, yeah, I, I, I relate to the Nigerian culture so much that I almost, I almost like have an inkling that I'm like Nigerian. But what were you saying, Sadiqwa? I was asking why, um, but how do you relate to Nigerian culture? You're um, you scamming. <laughs> yeah, I be, I be scamming people. I mean, some people are gonna, some people are gonna see this episode and try to call me. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I, uh, <laughs> I uh, there's a lot of similarities between Nigeria because I lived in the Jamaica Republic for a few years for like 10 years too and there's a lot of similarities between like Latino culture and Nigerian culture specifically and the way that like families are set up and like stuff so so it's like I, I seem to like fit in a little bit you know what I mean and when it comes to like the different tribes and the different traditions and foods and all that stuff I kind of you know what I mean? Like I kind of just like fit into relate. it. Relate I relate. To them. Yeah, exactly. Like I relate to it. So I'm like, uh oh, I might have I might have a little bit of Nigerian prince in my blood, but but anyway, <laughs> to the main topic that we want to talk about. Chris Rock's special. Ah. Chris Rock came out with the special on Netflix. Uh when was it? March. Last Last Sunday? Last no, Saturday. Saturday. Last Saturday. So that date was, let me check real quick. So that was the fourth. fourth. Yes. It came out, it came out the day after uh, Creed 3. So on March 4th, um, Chris Rock did a special live on Netflix. Now, for those of you that might not realize why that's a big deal, 
is because most comedians, when they film their specials for HBO or Netflix or Showtime or Tubi or whatever, um, they usually film over a course of two to three shows in a night or a couple days, and then they edit that together. For example, if you ever saw the show, uh, the uh, Richard Pryor special Live on Sunset, he filmed that over the course of two nights. Now, the first night didn't go that well. Right. So then the second night was mostly of what the special is, but they usually take an amalgamation of two shows or two or three shows, and they end up chopping it together for it to be the best product as, as possible. So when you're actually doing a live event, uh, like a sports game or something like that, it, what you see is what you get. It is what it is, right? So... It is co- it is uh, an accomplishment for uh, there's been more airplanes flying over my apartment recently uh, around this time. I don't know what's going on. I can't um, even hear it. Yeah, I can hear it in my headphones. Anyway, sorry. Um, for for a comedian to do an out, I think he did like an hour six, hour five, something like that. For a comedian to come out and do an hour live. That's a lot of that's a lot of pressure because it's in front of millions of people. I mean, it's like you can have a bad show every now and then, but you know, I, I mean, Chris Rock is 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 a master of his craft, but then at the same time, too, nothing is guaranteed, right? And I don't think that this was uh, that this was a guarantee to do it live. Um, yeah. Now that you mentioned that uh, comedians usually take a couple of shows and merge them together. Um, it was very evident that this was a live show. Well, what do you mean when you uh, when you say that? Um, I could pick up on uh, the liveness of it. Like, um, he wasn't quite ready at the beginning. The announcer announced his name twice. Um, he came out, he didn't seem in rhythm, uh, in timing. He fumbled over some words. Um, you know, I thought there were a plethora of things that alluded to it being live and in comparison to comedians taking a couple of days to put together a show that you get the best product um you know i think it was just noticeable mm-hmm. well, well uh, the most noticeable to me was when he um confused concussion with emancipation that was the biggest flub and that was towards the end when we were building up and waiting for his joke about the slap and so for him to mix those up it kind of like defl- like it, it took the air out of that joke mm-hmm. i thought there were a couple of fumbles i mean who am i to really have i mean this 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 episode is dedicated to critiquing that right but who am i to judge chris rock who has done some phenomenal hour plus stand-ups over the years he's the first person that in my opinion i applaud applaud because he has the balls to say crack ass cracker and keep it going. I mean, that takes a lot of guts and balls, especially in this industry. Um, but I thought that he missed or he fumbled or I could tell he fumbled over his words or, you know, he, I could I could just tell it was very evident uh, mm-hmm. in this stand up to me. And to me, the material seemed a bit rushed. Like I just rewatched like the first half hour of Tambourine and that material was more nuanced. It was commentary on police shootings, racism, gun control. I mean, he hit in the first half hour. I mean, so for joke for joke, I mean, just the contrast between Tambourine and this special, because yeah, he had, you know, six, seven years, but everyone, because of what happened last year, everyone was expecting him to talk about the slap. Um, and so it's like, do you hit it, do you hit it up top? Because we're only watching for that, or do you wait till the end? So you have to leave it to the end of the special, but it was kind of, to me, anticlimactic. Well, I think I think as comedians, I think we do we should be allowed to. So, so I I don't know if it's just me, but I'm I I kind of critique everything I watch, like you know what I mean. Um, and I don't I personally don't necessarily view it as a negative, and I guess one of the reasons is because I've been critiqued all of my life. You know what I mean. So it's one of those things where I'm kind of just used to just people because people have no problem telling me that I stink at something. You know what I'm saying? So <laughs> it's just one of those things where I'm just kind of like, oh, okay, well, that's 
like how things go. You know, I mean, if you don't think, I mean, I'm not, I mean, we're on the podcast, but I'm not broadcasting it. You know, I'm not just coming out and voluntarily just saying, oh, this stunk or whatever. Right. right. But if I think when it gets to a point where you take comedy very, very seriously, and you're trying to like navigate the industry and stuff, and you're trying to move the way the industry is moving. Sometimes you get worried when you see the type of pro- final products that are coming out of the comedy. Mm. Industry. You know what I mean? Like for example, when I started in 2003, first of all, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know the concept of, cause I always wanted to be a filmmaker, right? So I didn't know the concept of a comedian working, also being a writer and a director and a filmmaker and an actor and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. I mean, I knew of Bill Cosby and Sinbag and Chris Rock back then and Dave Chappelle and all that stuff, but I never took the two and put them together. I didn't know the grind was becoming an entertainment entity versus, you know what I mean? So like when I started, it was kind of like, I was in school and I was like, oh, I just, people keep picking on me. So I just want to talk about how can I do that? Oh, I'm just going to do like comedy and a talent show or whatever. Right. And it wasn't really like, I knew how to, I knew like what nuance was. I knew how to construct a joke or anything. I just got on stage and just said what I wanted to say. It didn't make that. Right. So back then it was kind of just getting it out. Right. And then starting taking it seriously. Even when I went to New York, even when I went to Philly in New York, even in the, in the early aughts you know what i mean like in 2008 2009 even 2010 even up up until like 2014 social media wasn't a thing Mm-mm. everybody was just at the open mics working on material maybe you get booked on a show maybe you don't there was more rooms that were shows but were more open to up-and-coming comedians to come and work out material in these areas in Philly and Sadiqa, you know, like in Brooklyn and all that stuff, there was there was tons of rooms where you just went around and you just ran material, right? So the idea of building a fan base based on something that wasn't jokes mm-hmm. has all has been a hard it's been a hard pill pill to swallow for me because now I feel like I'm giving up. And it's funny because a few years ago I was dating a girl, I was dating a woman. And the first thing she said, this was in 2000 and I don't know when Instagram came out, but it was like 2008 or 2008 or nine. And she told me, she said, man, you should like, get your Instagram followers up, like, right now. Like, this was, like, back in 2008, 2008. She's like, yeah, you should work on, like, your Instagram. And I was like, <laughs> you don't know what you're talking about. Don't, I don't, I don't need to work on Instagram. Like, like I had, like, 100 followers at the time. So I'm like, don't. No one Turns out she was Miss Cleo. Uh, yeah. <laughs> now I'm like, man, if I were to listen to her, I would have, like, a million followers by now. You know what I mean? Right. So, so now it's, it's and it's not social media com- it's not really social media comics because a lot of people like to attack social media comics it's the industry yeah because now the industry wants more infamous than famous right so mm-hmm. everything is like a i feel like everything is like a um everything is like a what you would call it like a uh, a headline yeah. Just think of the house party movie. Like think of that like all the people they cast in house party. Like who are these people? People with large social media followings. <laughs> yeah. So so how it affects how it affects older comics because what's going on now too is and it's gonna sound mean as fuck. What's going on now too is that older comics are now kind of in the way does that make sense because back because back in the day our ogs back in the day they had def jam and all that stuff and then there was a like if you didn't cross over like chris rock and dave chappelle and russell peters and all and all that stuff there there's a lull between your career starting on def jam 
and now. So it's like you're making, you're doing shows, you're making movies, you're doing, but now it's like, now we're talking about fame, right? So you're like, okay, we got Kevin Hart, we got James Brown, we got Amy Schumann, one of those people. Now the fame is coming in, okay, now I need to build my social media following. So I'm an OG doing Instagram and stuff now. So now like you're, so now you're like even still like a newer comic and you're like, okay, I'm trying to like find my way. But now I have to transverse. I have to respectfully transverse all my OGs to like to like cross over. You know what I mean? Cross over into what could be success. I don't know. Like it's it's. I don't know. I mean, are you feeling like Dio Hughley's and this? I mean, like, cause like he has millions of followers or like Earthquake. I mean, but like all they're doing is reposting trauma, like. You know what I'm saying? And then D.O. Hughley doesn't even control his page. I'm sure Earthquake doesn't control his either. Like, I mean, but they're just reposting, like, stories that matter to Black people or funny memes. So it's like they're posting, like, five, six times a day. Well, what's interesting about Earthquake is that Earthquake, we've known Earthquake forever. Yeah. And it was, like, last year that white people discovered earthquake. Like, ain't that something? Like, it's, 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 <laughs> like, people well, have, that's like, what next. That's what Netflix half hour will do. That, yeah, that's, wait, what are you saying, Sadiqa? You're on mute. You're on mute. I'm sorry. I think there are quite a few comedians in our, in our community that we know that, um, you know, especially a lot of um, people who have been around for 20 years who haven't necessarily got to that next level, who haven't broken it, broken completely, and Earthquake is one of those guys. Um, but yeah, a half an hour special will do that to you. Um, but I agree with you, their, uh, their social media presence isn't necessarily their comedy. It is a lot of, um, you know, reposting or things that are interesting to the community. Um, that I think their fan base is is, ba is built on. Um, but there has been a shift and because even like representation is like, how is your social media, uh, you know, how many, how many follow you're following on social media? Like even when you, you know, you're trying to break in uh, for acting purposes, like you said, uh, most of the people who were who were uh, cast in House Party were from social media, so I think there is a shift that that we're all faced with on how do we, if we're partial old school but partial we're here in the new school, how do we make that transition or how do I think that's quite challenging for um, for a whole group of of comedians. Yeah, and and I think. I think when it comes to, not to compare, but I think when it comes to like Dave Chappelle, like Dave Chappelle has become this anomaly where he doesn't need social media. I mean, there's a few of those. There's Dave Chappelle, there's like Gerard Carmichael. There's, there's, there's a few that you don't, they don't have to be in your face all the time. I mean, I do think that Kevin kind of started the trend of comedians. Like Kevin was always ahead of the game when it came to like relevancy and stuff like that. I think he did start the trend of like comedians becoming um, like social media rock stars. And I think the industry kind of picked up on that and said, okay, well, this guy has Beyonce numbers, right? So any comedian that we're going to put on needs to like be on that trajectory, right? Mm -hmm. um, so then when it comes to like this special, it feels like it feels like it's a Chris Rock in the social media age. That's what it felt like to me. Really? Like, it really felt like he was like, okay, this is what people want to hear. So I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to do this special for clickbait. Like, I'm going to do this special so that it gets the hits. That's how I felt. Right? And full, like, transparency, I saw Chris Rock at the Dolby in November. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the set at the Dolby was longer and it was a little different in the sense that he took the Will Smith joke and he made it the fourth joke of the special. Okay. So he came out and he opened with 
Um, you know, everyone's selective outrage. Everyone's sensitive. No one's been punched in the face. Blah blah blah. Everyone's a victim. Um, you know, everyone wants attention. Everyone's a victim. And then he went. You know, I was smacked by Shug Smith, and which I thought was funny. I was slapped by Shug Smith, and even I. You know, I went to work the next day. Like the emancipation stuff that wasn't even in because I don't. The emancipation mm-hmm. any hasn't hadn't even come out by then. So, and the whole stuff about Jada and him going off, that wasn't in, in the show either. Okay. So it's basically like a small part of the show, right? And then he talked about his daughters. Mm-hmm. Um, culinary school, all that stuff, mm-hmm. being kicked out of school. And then he talked about dating. Mm-hmm. And it was like Chris Rock going, dating's hard, right? Like it was, that was like, <laughs> right? And the last joke that he did was like dating older women, right? Dating older women. And he's like, the best, the best thing about dating an older woman is when she calls you, says, my kids ain't going to be home this weekend. And then that was like the end <laughs> of the set, right? Yeah, yeah. But my <clears throat> friend and I, who was another comic, we left the show and we kind of looked at each other. Because when you're a comic that's like not famous or you're up and coming, you feel guilty when you're like criticizing the greats. You know what I mean? Like you go and see civilians, they don't give a shit. Like they'll just be like, oh, that was whack or whatever, right? But like a comedian, you're like, yo, I this might be sacrilege, right? right. So so we're leaving the theater and we're literally like looking around. And then we're like, yo, what did you what did you think about what did you think about the show? And we like waited until we got outside to say how we felt because we both felt the same way. We were like, I I don't think it was that good. Right. And this was the live show. And, and because while we were watching the show, we were coming up with tags for mm-hmm. his jokes because we were like, the jokes, they just don't, they just don't feel like they're finished. Like he's like giving premises and he like says a thing and then he like moves up. Like, like what? Like the joke isn't, the joke wasn't done. Like, what happened, right? But at that time, we were like, but he's, like, working on the hour. So right. so maybe we were just getting, like, premises and stuff just to see. He was just trying to see how it would work. And then we'll get the final product in the show and then the special, mm-hmm. right? And then I watched the special, and I was like, oh, shit, that was it? Like, <laughs> like that was the final version. And then he took he took a bunch of stuff. like there's actually a part in the on the show that he did at the Dolby where he had a screen behind him and he was showing text messages that he was getting from women on the screen. Mm. And I was like, this is some Kevin Hart shit. Like Kevin He's did this. Reaching. Huh? He's reaching. Yeah, Kevin did this in his last special. Mm. Well, what was Was that the one where he where was he in the pajamas? That one? No, the one after that. Irresponsible. <laughs> oh, okay. One in, wait a minute. Irris- yeah. Was Irresponsible the pajamas one? Or which one was the pajamas one? I don't know. It was terrible. No fucks, so I... no fucks given. That was the pajamas one. Yeah, okay. Yeah, no fucks <laughs> given. That was pajamas. And then Irresponsible was the last one he did. And he had this whole thing where he had this screen behind him. And he got out his phone and it's like, let me show you these text messages as I begin. And then it's like... so. so oh, yeah. Like, I don't think I finished that one. <laughs> That one at all. So Chris Rock did that at the show at the Dolby. Mm. And it was all of this material about dating. And I was just like, is that what no, you but want? Huh? He changed it to like um dating older women, like you gotta get their roof fixed, gotta get their car fixed, gotta walk, go, gotta go with them to the auto shop. Da, 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 da. He, um, he, he said he said all that stuff in in the he show. He did oh, okay. Okay. But it was one of those things where I'm kind of like, but I'm not listening. I don't. I'm not going to see Chris Rock to listen to his like mundane dating stories. I want to hear some Chris Rock dating stories, but not like man. But not right. like open. You know what I mean? No. Yeah, like not- him dating on Raya. Like him finding someone like um, who's that girl that was dating Kanye? I forgot her name. Like but- Amber Rose or uh, or. Uh, not Amber Rose, but the white chick who like, didn't look like anything, but like she was dating everybody. She dated Drake, she dated Kanye. Dude, like... Julia Fox? 
Yeah, Julia Fox, like someone like that. Like I want to hear about him meeting Julia Fox on Raya. You know what I'm saying? Like, like I going mean, to her house and seeing how jacked up her house is. <laughs> right, the roaches and rats. <laughs> I just remember her like her bedroom was in the living room. Like her house was a total yeah. mess. She went on live. Yeah. So, oh, yeah, yeah, that would have been something like that would have been funny. Yeah, I thought a lot, of, quite a few of the jokes were disjointed. Um, you know, the, everybody just wants attention. You know, it was, it's just like, and, and I didn't think that the part that he, when he started getting into the Will and Jada portion of it, I didn't think that was all that funny. I thought it was more of a rant. Um, his high pitched voice, he got really high pitched and mm -hmm. he was kind of just kind of spitting and blah, he was, you know, kind of angry. And then he drops the mic and I'm like, I could see if everyone was in stitches in the audience for yeah. you to drop the mic, but they weren't. So I don't understand why you even dropped the mic. You're like, you should have <laughs> well, put the mic back in the mic stick. Not come oh, for yeah. black parents to be like, nah, -uh, he hit you. You better hit his ass back. Uh -uh, excuse my right. friend. <laughs> well, nah, I don't, my parents don't want me to fight in front of white people. Boy, I mean. Ahead, well, I'm point sorry. to Chris Rock for being extra petty for doing it in Baltimore, the birthplace of Jada Pinkett Smith. Uh, second, now also I'm points to Chris. I wondered. <laughs> yeah, and then also points to Chris Rock for keeping her her name out of his motherfucking mouth because he did not say her name one time. He called her a bitch, but he did not once utter the word Jada at all. He said <laughs> Will Smith's wife. If you if you watch it, he keeps her name out of his motherfucking mouth. <laughs> well, you know, you know, you know what's funny. Let's so, learn. So that was the part I liked about the special. You know, what I mean, really? like, like I was like, I mean, considering, you know, what I mean, I was like, okay, that was cool. You know, like, like because the whole time I'm just like, these are like open mic jokes, and then he gets in, I'm like, okay, all right, Chris. Um, remember it. Now, now, no, I, I like the joke about the Kardashians, like the Kardashian curse, like Rob Kardashian got OJ off. So now all of all of her, all of her, all of Chris Jenner's daughters are, you know, cursed to date black men. <laughs> I think the joke about his daughter, because I just I literally just rewatched Tambourine. He talked about her biting kids when she was like a toddler. So I'm like, she's still fucking biting people at 22. Like, no, come on, dog. You know, there's... like. <laughs> You know, it's funny because that Kardashian joke they're, they're, in his original special, uh, he talked about God three times. And originally there was a joke in it where he talked about Hillary Clinton winning mm -hmm. against Donald Trump. And God was a character in his set. Like God would come down and he would like mm -hmm. talk to people and then they wouldn't listen to him. So, so like God came down and was like, Hillary, you need to campaign and 48 states or whatever, right? And she didn't do it. And then she lost to Barack. And then she came down again. And he's like, oh, you're, you're, you're up against a, uh, a talk show host. Um, you need to campaign in 48 states. And it, I made it easy for you. This guy's a talk show host, you know? And then, uh, so she didn't, she lost to Trump. And then he was talking about like the hurricane in Puerto Rico and stuff. And he's like, yeah, that's how a talk show host would deal with it by tossing paper bag paper towels <laughs> to people right so those mm -hmm. are the jokes that were originally like in his set that he took out like he took out like a lot of shit mm -hmm. or like what we got and then the third time was that when you talked about the kardashians and it was god came down and told rob kardashian that now all your daughters are going to do is fuck black men like that's mm -hmm. it was like a theme so i i think we'll call that yeah i think if he would have actually like kept the the those three instances in the set intact, I think the Kardashian joke might have hit harder because it would have been like a callback to like the stuff mm. before, right? And I think the joke about his daughter was too long. I mean, like he basically was basically talking about having a nepo baby, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, and like for it to go all around, for, you know, her biting kids to her her biting his mom when she went to visit in Paris. Like I just think it was too roundabout and it, I mean, the payoff wasn't there in the end to me. I mean, you better be proud of passing down some generational wealth. Shit. There's a lot of misses to me. Against, against popular belief, Chris's wife was, was ex-wife is black and his daughters black. are black. I know. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm just saying, cause people trying to talk like Chris hates black women and shit. And I'm like, yo, but his, his family's black. So just, 
No. Right. I don't get I don't get that from him, even though I think that, you know, he likes to date white women too. Um, that's clear. Uh, and I think that he's probably looking for get his chance with a white woman. Um <laughs> so he I mean, can have he's his probably time. white women hang around famous black dudes, so but he's um, you know, he's always been that guy who's kind of like, you know, he makes a lot of movies with that say night live type through and they're you know they're a mixture mainly white you know he's but you know he's he's been in that crowd so i wouldn't be surprised i just i just thought that you know overall and i really liked uh a couple of his last special tambourine was cool um, but what's the special when he was in the all black um uh what's that bigger and blacker bigger and blacker how could i forget yeah bigger and black that's yeah. probably my favorite um, I just thought there were a lot of misses. Um, like, you know, he talked about uh, he went to his old neighborhood. He saw Fred. It's just so random. He saw Fred and Fred was like, oh, I'm in a safe environment. It's just, I just thought it was just random. They were disjointed. There wasn't a rhythm of flow. His callbacks were, I thought, weak. And, you know, I just, it seemed rushed. And now, to, but to put it in perspective that comedians take two or three shows and merge them that's a whole you know that gives me a lot more perspective because i know it's not easy and that's what i kept saying watching it like you know this is a ch it's challenging to go up there and do an hour for anyone especially if you're four five six specials in you've done that you've done an hour four or five times you know it's like the rappers who fir first album is great but it's not easy mm -hmm. to reproduce that right it's, it's so not, the, yeah. That's why we, we give so much honor and respect to those who are able to reproduce and, and continue to put out good material. But yeah, I thought this this one he he this one was kind of like flat. Man. And it's funny, Keeney, you you talked about um you think he's doing this for clickbait. Like he did a whole joke about his dad possibly being hypothetically trans, and like that like nobody even talked about it. Like it was supposed to make people upset. Like, because he hit on the trans issue, and it was like no one even cared. I mean, it was positive. I mean, his dad has passed. His, pa his dad right. passed back in the eighties. So, I mean, it was kind of one of those things where it's like, okay, you know, what I mean, you're, like, reaching. You're, you're just like, okay, yeah. I mean, sure, but you know, um, I I think to your point, I think a good way of ending the special. Well, instead of saying don't fire in front of white people, because I thought that was woke, well, who cares what white people think? Right. Yeah. Um, I would have said, I will look right into the camera and be like, Will, <laughs> and look, Will, I kept your na wife's name out my fucking mouth and then like do the mic down. Like that would have been, yeah. 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 <laughs> that, that that, been great. Yeah. That would have been great. Yeah. Like, if you purposely are like, I'm going to call Jada a bitch. Because, because again, you have to have a, when it comes to jokes, you have to have a reason. Yeah. Make a point. I mean, just calling her a bitch, it's like, not enough. why are we, why are we doing that? Right. But if you're specifically yeah. like, this is the reason why I'm doing it. This is the punchline. I think that would have been a bigger thing. That was, that was a good idea, Melanie. Yeah. Well, um, he also, um, Cause like I was like right after the special, I went on Twitter and there were two camps, like either people that already liked Chris Rock or already hated Chris Rock. So the camp that already hated Chris Rock, they weren't going to like the special regardless. And then the people who, you know, praise Chris Rock is like, oh, it's like Dave Chappelle. He can do no wrong because I can tell you Dave Chappelle's maybe last two specials. I was just like, eh. you know what I'm saying to me? And I'm like, but I have huge respect for him because of his whole body of work. This, I had the same sentiment about Chris Rock. Like this wasn't his best, and but do, does it does it take away from his legacy as a comedian? Absolutely not. But it did feel rushed and pieced together. And like Sadiq was said, this disjointed and just not all the way together. Like like not all the way developed, like you said, Keenan. Period. Well, I, I I think see, and there's this thing where. There's this thing I've noticed that when it comes to, and, and I get, and I kind of want to like move into this conversation is when did like black people lose their sense of humor? Because what, because what has happened recently is that we're not allowed to criticize black people until we criticize black people. You the social I mean? media, I think. 
it's a direct correlation for social media. Even, you know, the fact that that social media can shut your account down if you say certain things. There was a point in time where, you know, we, we a certain way how we talk. It's just our culture, right? We talk a certain way. We say certain words that are not privy to other uh, cultures because it's just our thing, right? Um, and we all know what they are. Uh, but social media shut you down for for being how you are in the midst with your people, and it's like, what? That's how we talk to each other. Or uh, they'll they'll uh, you know shut your account down. They'll put you like they call Facebook jail. I think that that social media has a lot to do with the sensitivity of people in general, and I think that Black people in America tend to follow uh, the 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 bigger. Uh, group of Americans, right? Because because we've all that's been one of our main challenges is that we want to be included in the grand scope of what is America. So we tend to follow the what the um, what the masses are doing or what the majority is doing, uh, just in general as Americans, right? And so on social media, you have been limited to say certain things, even. You know how we just talk. We have to watch that, and I think that's transferred over into, in general, especially with comedy. Um, look, he had a whole transgender set, like uh, like Melody said, and the trend, the gays, the LGBTs didn't even give up. We didn't even, we didn't even care. Nobody cared, and they say, oh, "Well, it couldn't have been that good because we didn't care, right?" Um, so you know, it's one of those things where. I think it's just become in general, watch what you say, watch how you say it, because the it, the repercussion it can be loud and can be very harmful to your own self if if a group decides to protest or to, to deem what you're saying unacceptable, I think. But that shit's horrible though. Like let, me, let, me, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. So as as black comedians, so so everyone knows there's a difference between urban rooms and mainstream sure. rooms. Mainstream rooms are the rooms that everybody goes to, right? And they have their own challenges because white people are very sensitive about comedy too, especially when a black person's saying it. So let's not act like this is a black thing or whatever, but we're talking about black people right now. So um, black urban rooms, I call them power rooms. That's what I call them. Um, I don't <laughs> like urban. I don't call them black or urban. I think they're power rooms because they make you better comedians. Mm -hmm. But back before the pandemic for a while, the power room was be funny. So you're like, okay, they didn't laugh because I wasn't funny. And they would tell you, they're like, yo, dog, that wasn't funny. That was kind of corny, whatever, right? Right? But now after the pandemic, it's not that it's, you can't say shit now. Where are even our power rooms at? I mean, I'm not to say we don't have urban rooms, but where is the, where are the rooms where, you know, there was a point, and I just, I'm, I'm fairly new in comedy. I'm just a little over five years uh, doing comedy, but just from being around, where are those rooms where you know to go for did, did the you power, start, did you the power start, of the people? The power though. Did you start in New York? No, and um, like Millie, I moved here from Atlanta, uh, so okay, I was in Atlanta, Atlanta ten years. Yeah, prior to me relocating, so I started in Atlanta. So New York, and I started. I started here. <laughs> New York lost every lost all of their power rooms. Power rooms, right? Mm. I used to go to every Wednesday. I used to go to uh, there was a bar across the street from my house called the Essence Room, mm. and it was hosted by Damon Rosaire every Wednesday, 10 o'clock every Wednesday. And that was a room that it was always packed. It was in bed -Stuy. It was on Atlantic. Mm -hmm. It was on Atlantic and bed -Stuy. Packed rooms. Everybody. Brooklyn, everybody. Uh, and you would... I bombed for like two years straight. But then eventually, you know, unfortunately, while I was living in New York, Damon passed. And other people took it over, but but I went back now. It's now like an open mic, and nobody goes to it. Mm. No one goes. Right. I don't. I don't think Lindenwood, Lindenwood Diner is a thing anymore. Mocha in Harlem, that Smokey Suarez used to host every Monday. Mocha was a hard room. I think Mocha closed. 
Well, now um, I think Smokey just opened a uh, comedy in Harlem. Well, the, the, the owners of comedy in Harlem is Jamie Roberts and uh, Nikki Sunshine. Okay. But he has taken, um, he's taken a comedy in Harlem to comedy. Uh, he's taken Mo the Mocha show, Mocha Monday over there. He's taken okay. It to comedy in Harlem. Thanks for that shout out, Melanie. He's taking it to comedy in Harlem. So now we have comedy in Harlem, which is the black owned comedy club in Harlem. You also got the Grizzly Pair, Kenny Warren. Uh, we got the Grizzly Pair and and Greenwich Village and also in Midtown. Full disclosure about Grizzly Pear. Grizzly Pear has never really been a power room. It's kind of more like alternative mainstream, but it's a cool, it's a cool room. But when it came to rooms that were like, I don't even know if uh, Footprints is still a thing anymore. I think they stopped doing shows at Footprints, maybe. Um, I think Salsa Con Fuego in the Bronx with Rob Stapleton, I think, is still a thing. I think um, so. Amateur Night at the Apollo, obviously, is still a thing. But a lot of the rooms in New York, for example, where these guys were coming, and these were all of the people that used to host these rooms were all OG Def Jam comics. Mm -hmm. Like Town and Smokey Suarez and, right. and comics. Mm -hmm. comics stuff. So places all you wanted to be. You wanted to be in those rooms. Yeah. Even if it sucked. <laughs> you wanted so, to earn, earn your So bones. the pandemic wiped all those rooms out. Mm -hmm. Right, and I can't not see. not in, not in Chicago because I was I just came back from doing comedy in Chicago, and when I tell you there are some power rooms, Riddles, um, on the South Side on Monday night, um, this other spot called Bartenders, uh, hosted by Leon Rogers, who's a veteran comedian, Damien Williams mm -hmm. hosting at Riddles, veteran comedian, um, this other spot called the Black Fire Brigade, hosted by Just Niche, up and coming, you know, making noise, female comedian out of Chicago. So when I tell you I was building the fire those four months, I got my licking every night. I had to prove I was black and prove I was funny, like, <laughs> but not pander and just do my do my jokes like right. not pander like because I'm from the south side, so I don't have to. I went to all black uh, all black elementary school, mostly black high school. You know, didn't go to a um, HBCU, but I mean at a PWI, I found my black people. So I really like Chicago. You can live your whole life and not interact with black with white with white people at all. That's how segregated Chicago is. So Going home, it was like I was embraced because I still had that in me. I don't have to pan my people. These are my people. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, just on say Marlon Mitchell, like Francis, where I did a set and then like somebody shot at the parking lot. Like these are the rooms <laughs> I was doing. Red yeah, Star I, with Big Keith. Like, I mean, you know what I'm saying? Michi Hall. Like I've been, I've been like, I, I ran into Little Rail at the dime because that's, I think he has, I think he owns stock in it. Um, but I was telling him about all the people I met. He was like, yeah, you basically met everybody. But people like Deion Cole, D-Ray, Little Rail, Corey Holcomb. These are all Chicago people that are out here now. But those rooms made those made these people, you know, being yeah, from Chicago, Chicago, like, yeah. made, like jokes and notes. Chicago you know? comedians are, they, they come with the fire. Yeah. I, uh, speaking of that, like, when I was coming up, I got two guns pulled on me, one in Philly, one in the Poconos, oh. which is weird. Um, That's weird. <laughs> I got shit thrown at me, chicken wings and all that shit thrown at me and stuff like that. Oh my god! And it's funny because my parents they moved us to the suburbs. I was pro black in the cul de sac. You know what I'm saying? Like they moved us to the suburbs. <laughs> they moved us to to the suburbs to get away from all that shit. And then I'm like, I'm going to do comedy around black folks. And then I just walked back into the fire. He's like, nigga, I. <laughs> I raised you to get you away from this shit. Now you're gonna walk back, right? And, and it's like, well, but that's who. That's who I want to be. My fans, but I feel okay. You, you, you were gonna say something, Sadiq. What did I say? What I'm gonna. No, say. I was just gonna say that maybe you know, just our 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 rooms haven't bounced back as fast as mainstream rooms. Just probably, you know, it's a financial thing. Where we're gonna, it's gonna take more time for any of our rooms that were affected by the pandemic. I think, which is gonna take a little bit more time for us to bounce back. But you know, there are certain black rooms here in LA, or not black rooms. We have nights, mm -hmm. major places here in LA, and but you know, in those environments, and I don't want to say nothing crazy because you know I want to get up in there too, but. Even in those environments, like we talked about a little bit of pandering and it's who you know and da 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 da. Because you know, black people act like white people in America, so. <laughs> so, so, so. When we, need, when we have to. 
So, so LA black comedy is weird. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it is weird. I, and that's what I'm saying. Like before it used to be, you ain't funny in Mm -hmm. LA. It's like, you don't talk, you shouldn't talk about that. I remember, I remember I did this one show where I was talking about interracial dating and that black crowd was not having the shit. Mm. And like, and like when it was like interracial, I was like making fun of it. You know what I mean? Like I was like, you know, I mean, I've been in black rooms where they tell me like, we don't want to hear that gay shit. We don't want to hear that dyke shit. Yeah, it's, it's, It, it's it's we you know it's Atlanta's weird. like that as well too. I've had instances in Atlanta where they tell me we don't. I'm like this is the gayest black city in America. What you exactly? But well, I can't. Well, I can't talk. <laughs> I can't be me and talk my tell my story. You're like That's I'm crazy. at the Laughing Skull in Midtown. I am the gay. I'm in the gay center, black gay center of America, and I can't talk my shit. This, what? This is talk the about sub- the black rooms in Atlanta. Oh, like uptown. Yeah. Yeah. I mean mm. it's yeah. I mean it's Comedy. it's Whatever. and maybe and maybe I'm reaching by saying this, but it just feels like it feels and I and this is the reason I I I this is I'm gonna get to the point. This is why I said what I said. I feel okay, so after the the slap happened, right? The conversation turned into should Will have done it, or this is why Chris Rock deserved it. Mm-hmm. And what started happening was it turned into a black women are the most disrespected and the most this and the most that or whatever, blah blah blah. And it's like, and when I say blah blah blah, I'm not dismissing your feelings, but I'm saying you're trying to hold comedy hostage because of a projection. I feel, in my opinion, I feel, right? And the fact that I'm worried about what I'm saying on this podcast is the problem. You understand what I'm saying? Because I'm like, I have to make sure I say it a certain type of way so that people don't take it as, you know what I mean? No, they'll pick it up and throw it in your face as soon as you see an inkling of success. Well, I'll give you I'll give you an example. I did a, I opened for a comedian on the Zoom show. Mm-hmm. And I did 25 minutes and it was an amazing 24 minutes and 30 seconds. <laughs> I was getting applause breaks, but and as soon as I said at the end of my set, I have this I had this bit where I talked about being in a situation ship with a with my girlfriend during the pandemic. I remember that joke. I remember yeah. that joke. And I said and it's usually a funny joke, right? But I said, you know, I'm in a situation ship with my girl. We watched 90 Day Fiance. And, you know, you know, my girl, she's a black woman. So, you know, sometimes y'all can be difficult, right? Mm-hmm. And as soon as I said that, the joke was over. Like, yeah. the joke, like, they didn't even let me. Like, someone was like, we ain't doing none of that now. And every no one would let me finish my set. Wow. And then they're in the Isn't comments it? like, yo. They're like, your mama black, and and you know, you go and get yourself a white girl and leave us alone and blah blah blah. And I'm like, first of all, I didn't that's not what I like, I didn't say that, you know what I mean? Right. So I did a podcast with the same comedian a few months ago, right? And this gets me to my point where I'm talking on the podcast, and I look down in the comments on the YouTube thing. And one in the comments says, oh, that's the dude that was talking shit about black women. And he oh my God. Out of him. Now, this happened two years ago. Wait a minute. Is it you know who? Is it our friend? Yes. Okay. All right. um, but this happened two years ago, right? Yeah, I remember. So, the, oh, yeah. so I told the joke two years ago. And a month ago, someone was like, oh, this guy talked shit about black First of all, I don't talk shit about black women. <laughs> no, you don't. You the don't. joke wasn't talking shit about black women either. Right. But the way it's being translated in the future is now he doesn't like this yeah. group. Yeah. And I'm and they're not saying I should be canceled, but you can kind of see where that thinking goes, where now it's like, oh, he should be canceled because he's talking shit about this particular group, right? I think it's dangerous because like, for instance, I saw on Twitter, 
people are like, oh, she, he knew she had alopecia. He didn't know that shit. And it hasn't really been established that she has alopecia or not. Either way, he had no knowledge of it. So it's like, you can't make a joke about someone's bald head. I mean, we, we talk about everything else and you can't talk about somebody because it's a black woman and you're a black man and you were married to a whole black woman for 20 years and you got two black daughters, but you can't talk about black women as a black man. So like, basically that's why Kevin Samuels is like the most hated person and when he died, black women was like ding dong, the witch is dead because he was talking about like, cause nobody can talk about black women. Like, come well, on. The, the, the Kevin Samuels I might have some bounce back on, but. <laughs> I, I agree I, with a lot of what but he said, but I the delivery that, wasn't the greatest. Yeah. I believe that they slapped that, that narrative. If it's something that goes against the brain of the woman, they'll slap that, oh, you're not allowed to say that and you're this because of that. So I totally, I mean, I totally hear you. Um, and like you said, Chris is allowed to, he was allowed to say, in my opinion, he, you allowed to talk, you go on red table and expose yourself every week or was. So people are allowed to have comments. And that's where I think, like you said, it's dangerous in, in general in, in, the, in the mainstream culture there's so many different pitfalls of, oh, you can't say that, or you can't have that disposition today. This is the sensitive thing. And I think it's the full pot and black people just happen to be in the pot. Well, I, and, and, and this is, and this is, this is the trend I've been noticing because after the slap happened, you know, Clubhouse was an app where you get oh, on and man. people talk. It was the cesspool of social media. Like, Everything you saw written on Facebook, people were saying out loud on Clubhouse, right? So there was this room with like 1,500, it was like a lot, it was like 2,000 people. Are you talking about the moan room? I'm kidding. No, not the moan room. I miss those though. But, <laughs> um, but there was a room about jokes, Black women and Chris Rock, right? And again, I believe I love black women. I think black women need to, to be respected. You know, I, I think I, that's, there is my preference. I don't know how that sounds, but I have utmost respect. I'm just saying in this room, the way it was being pushed, and this is how easy people are when they're trying to cancel people, because they brought me on stage as the resident comedian, right? And in my mind, I'm like, I know I can't say how I feel about what happened because I already know they're going to take it a certain way because the conversation. So basically I was explaining to them what comedy was and it shows that a lot of people don't really know the history of comedy. And I was like, look, a comedian goes through different things and all that stuff and they're allowed to express themselves and you're paying to listen to their viewpoints on different things because there might be some people in the audience that can relate to it, right? And the first thing a guy asked me, he said, he said, um, we got you. He said, Keenan, would you tell the Holocaust joke? And that's how I, when they said that, that's how I knew they didn't know stand-up comedy because I'm like, do you know what stand-up comedy is? Because first of all, even though stand-up comedy as, as the art form now was discovered by a black man, <laughs> most of the stand-up comedians were the Russian Jews that escaped Russia because of the, um, I forget what it's called, but they had their own like extermination of Jews in Russia. So they left, came here. Jews that actually survived the Holocaust came to America and became stand-up comedians, became stand-up comedians. So the fact that you're asking me, would I tell a Holocaust joke or would you think it's important to tell a Holocaust joke? You don't, know, you don't know the history of comedy. So you're trying to stick me, and again, that's, this is that, that's that thing what they try to do, where they try to stick you, where they try to get you, they try to clip you so that they can cancel you. It's like, bruh, you're trying to stick, you know that that's a volatile subject. And you're trying to like trap me into that, right? And then you're trying to equate it with me saying, look, I think Chris Rock should have a freedom of speech. Oh, okay, so you think that we should tell jokes about black women and disrespect them? And it's like, no, that's not what I said. It Like they tend to say, that. I said, no, that's not what I said I do, at all. If you want to, if it's funny. If it's funny. And the, thing it's about, funny. It, and the thing about it too is if 
a person dates black women. I mean, you don't necessarily have to say black women in the set. You can just be like, if you want to be like, look, women or whatever, if that's where you want to go, right? To kind of save yourself. But if you date, if we date, if we date a certain type of woman and then we're a comic, we should be allowed to talk about our relationships. Like, that's just the way it is. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, how can I be in a relationship with you and I can never talk about you? Like, are you kidding me? Or how can you live your life and not be able to talk about your life, period, no matter, you know, what your life is? It's like, I don't have a problem if it's funny talking about gays, talking about, you know, the gay community, uh, talking about how Jewish people always biting off of Black people with their, you know, oppression. I'm just saying, Mm -hmm. I'm just joking. But, or to talk about women or to talk about, you know, I love, like, People, you know, special needs or retards. I don't. If it's funny, I'm, I'm for it. And I think that's where, alluding back to your point about how did black people, or why are black people so so sensitive now? I think that all of those things, like during the Deaf Comedy Jam era, you could talk all that shit. You could talk all that. You could use all those words, retarded, fat. Oh, excuse my language. Uh, this, you know what I mean? Because for the most part. The whole period was funny. And you know, there was a f- level of funny that black people, you know, used to have like run around like they in church and do, you know, how, you know, that a level of funny that I very rarely see now in this well, day. We, and we had bigger fish to fry. We needed the humor. And the final thought that I'll say before we wrap the episode the reason I think we're more sensitive now is because we were inundated with negativity during the pandemic. And it was especially hard on black people because a lot of our, a lot of media was black focused and, and, and traumatic for us. We had George Floyd. We had the pandemic. We had the George Floyd protest. Ahmaud Arbery. Ahmaud Arbery. We had Breonna Taylor. Breonna Taylor, yep. And people started reacting to that differently than they did George Floyd. So some of our sisters started feeling a certain type of way and all that stuff. So the last thing you need after two years of that shit is Chris Rock getting on stage to talk about it because now Jada represents you. Mm. you, you and say, no, Jada, Jada don't represent me. Jada's in the top 1% of income earners or income uh, achievers because she married the right person because I can't remember the last movie she did besides Girls Trip. But uh, before that, I mean, set it off i don't know i mean she hadn't really been acting um so she just married the right person but i just don't like and then this whole like conversation around you know when he was protecting her honor her honor what is this the 1600s like i mean he was laughing until she gave him the side eye rolled her rolled her eyes to the back of her fucking head he's like oh shit now i gotta do something you know what I'm saying? So like him protecting her honor, lost him millions of dollars, got him fucking banned from the academy for 10 years. But black women talk about, well, I, I, my, I want my man to do that for me. You want your man to lose millions of dollars, you fucking idiot. Like, what are we talking about? He was wrong, period. And the fact that they huddled around him instead of Chris shows you who black Hollywood favors. Mm-hmm. It shows you like he's black Hollywood's darling. You know what I'm saying? And mm-hmm. like people... It took people like Ari Spears, who everyone hates, to be like, man, no, nah, he was wrong. You know what I'm saying? But like a lot of people, a lot of black comedians wouldn't say that Will Smith was wrong because they're his friends. And that pissed me off. I really wish Chris Rock wouldn't have taken an entire year to respond. It just you could have done something or said something sooner and got it out. The, I mean, I understand you're building up, but to me, the, the one hour special didn't... Um, didn't represent a whole year worth of working mm-hmm. tooling these jokes and, and crafting these jokes. Well, now Chris Rock can move on and Bad Boys 4 is coming. So everyone's on a, on a good <laughs> everyone's on a good trajectory. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode of Cultured. Uh Sadiqua, where can we find you? Uh, you can follow me on Instagram and Facebook and TikTok uh, at Sadiqua Scarlet. Uh, and also, um, I have a, a, a little bit of a residency at the Chateau. I host quite often over there, so catch me there, usually Thursday, Friday, or Saturday. Melanie, where can we find you? Um, you can find me on all social media at the Melanie Mary. Um, my, I, I put up my um, show dates on Instagram mainly. 
Um, and yeah, check me out. All right. And again, you know, you can follow me uh, on Instagram and Twitter at Keenan J. Floyd. Uh, make sure that you are following and subscribing and hit that bell for notifications of videos for more cultured episodes. Thank you so much for joining us and we'll catch you next time. Peace. <laughs>